Every year, when summer comes to the Maasai Mara Plains in southern Kenya, they become the scene of the world's most famous migration. The arrival of more than a million wildebeest, also known as news, attracts predators and carrion eaters from all over the region. It is the most extraordinary natural spectacle, the best known throughout the world. And yet few people know that the vanguard of this army of herbivores in perpetual motion, the spearhead that blazes the trail and first faces the dangers of the Great March, is not made up of wildebeest, but of zebras. It's early August, and we're on the banks of the Mara River in southwest Kenya. The river will be the zebra's final destination, the place that will decide whether the protagonists of our story will live another year or die trying to cross to the other side. About this time every year, the first herds of zebras and wildebeest appear on the horizon, heralding the Great Migration the arrival of two million herbivores on the plains along the river. But this year, the migrating animals haven't shown up yet. And hunger leads to aggressiveness. Hidden in the waters of the Mara River lie immense Nile crocodiles, which can grow to lengths of more than five meters or well over 16 feet and weigh close to 1,000 kilograms, or 2,200 pounds. Yeah. For most of the year, these crocodiles feed mainly on fish. But during the months of August and September, they hunt and gorge on large numbers of the wildebeest, zebras, and antelopes trying to cross the river. Since their prey are late to their appointment this year, the crocodiles are growing impatient, and as a result, more and more daring. The adult hippopotamuses aren't worried, though. No crocodile would dare to approach them. But the situation is quite different for a mother that has recently given birth. Even her closest relatives, the other hippos in the pod, keep their distance. The mother only allows her elder child to approach her and the newborn, and even then, she is very cautious. She's nervous and irritable, and loses her patience any time her little one moves around. The crocodiles around the pod of hippopotamuses keep their hungry eyes on the little hippo. Just one little mistake, and their lethal jaws will do the rest. But our mother hippo is an experienced parent, and she makes it clear from the start that anyone who approaches her newborn will meet certain death and even the biggest crocodiles get the message. Finally, one morning, there's a sign in the grasslands that the time of scarcity is coming to an end. The first zebras, the ones opening the way, are already grazing near the Mara River. And the hunters go on the move. Considering that they're the targets of the savannah's greatest predators, the zebras certainly wear very flashy coats. But it must be a pretty good design, since every species of zebra wears it, with slight variations. 
there are three species of zebras. The mountain zebra, the rarest of the three, lives in southwestern Africa. The Grevy's zebra is found in Ethiopia and northern Kenya. And the Burchell zebra, the most common, ranges over much of southern and eastern Africa. They all wear stripes, and their stripes help all of them to survive. But how? The answer probably lies in the eyes of their greatest enemies, the lions. Lions are able to see in almost total darkness, but they don't distinguish colors very well. The zebra's stripes break up their silhouette and make it hard for the lions to decide which animal to attack. If the zebras start to walk or run, all the lions see is a mass of stripes that conceals each individual zebra in a confusing tangle of clashing lines. And since they also have difficulty distinguishing colors, the end result is a stripy mirage that completely befuddles the lions. When the zebras arrive in the Maasai Mara, the great hunters stop stalking and chasing smaller prey. For the cheetahs, it means the end of a period of unsustainable competition. With great difficulty, this mother and her three grown cubs have managed to survive the harassment of the lions and hyenas, and now they can finally concentrate on their usual prey, the Thompson's gazelles. A few zebras mingle with the Thompson's gazelles, but our mother shows no interest in them. A hungry cheetah could try to catch a zebra foal, but the adults are definitely beyond their reach. And their young aren't easy prey either. The gregarious behavior of zebras protects the littlest members of the herd. If a cheetah comes too close to the herd, the zebras close ranks and establish a safety zone to keep it at bay. And if the cheetah still tries to approach the herd, the zebras show it what they're capable of. Our female doesn't even try it. She crosses in front of the zebras with her eyes already fixed on another target. Just ahead, within striking distance thanks to her amazing speed, stand her favorite prey. And cheetahs are the best hunters among all the felines. Untroubled by the cheetahs, the zebras approach the hillocks where the topis are standing guard over the savanna. These watchmen will warn them if their two main predators arrive on the scene. Lions and hyenas are the most fearsome hunters on the savanna. Both are able to hunt almost any animal. And perhaps because they share the top spot on the food chain, they are rivals, and consequently deadly enemies. Although their vantage point allows the topis to spot any approaching predators, it also exposes them at the top of the mound. But this is a calculated risk. These large antelopes are not only great sprinters, but also extraordinary distance runners. So once they have detected the enemy, they quickly run away and once they find a hiding spot, 
they disappear. The zebras also have their own strategies to spot their enemies. Their lookouts often stand in pairs, facing in opposite directions, so that they can cover the whole territory. The topis can rest a bit beside the zebras while the latter stand guard, returning the favor that the topis do for them from the heights of their observation points. For zebras, the unity of the herd is the most important factor in order for them to be able to survive in such a dangerous place. A rigid social structure led by a dominant male makes it possible for the herd to act in a concerted way to everyone's benefit, something that is going to turn out to be very useful to our group when they face their greatest annual test. Our herd reaches the banks of the Mara River. They are extremely nervous. The river is full of hungry crocodiles that are waiting for the great migration to cross the water. Our herd is the first to arrive. Every year, the wildebeest and zebras cross the Mara at the same spots. They are the easiest places to cross, bottlenecks that all the migratory herds pass through. Since the crocodiles don't know exactly where they're going to cross each year, the lead zebras have an advantage because their predators haven't yet concentrated at any particular crossing point. Once they have quenched their thirst after their long journey from the Serengeti Plains, the boldest zebras cross the river. Most of the herd follows them, and they all plunge into the water at the same time, as if there weren't any crocodiles lurking there. But there are crocodiles. The crocodiles are hungry, but only the biggest ones can take down an adult zebra, so most of the crocs wait for the younger foals to cross. A mother and her foal scan the river. The presence of the crocodiles keeps them from crossing. And our young protagonist sees for the first time what the terrible dragons of the Mara can do. When the crocodiles appear, the zebras that are already in the water hurry across. And the ones that haven't yet gone in stop in their tracks. As a consequence, the herd is split in two. The zebras that are already on the other side repeatedly call to the rest of the group to cross the river. And their persistence eventually convinces the stragglers. Another foal decides to cross. The number of crocodiles is still relatively low, and it's worth running the risk. But the crocodiles aren't the only hunters lying in wait for the zebras at the crossing point. The lions know that each crossing point is a bottleneck where their prey are forced to follow very narrow paths. So they often stalk them at those places. Hunting zebras is not without risk, however. An adult zebra can kill a lion with one good kick, and the way the zebras charge out of the river makes the hunt even more dangerous. The lioness hasn't emerged from the fight unscathed, but luckily for her, the wound isn't serious, and the nutritional value of the prey she has caught more than compensates for her effort and the loss of blood. Mm -hmm. 
The family of cheetahs has caught another meal. The arrival of the zebras makes it easier for the cheetahs to hunt because it draws the lions and hyenas away. But as the number of zebras and wildebeest grows on the plain, the number of vultures also increases, since they know that the savanna will soon be full of corpses. And even though the birds aren't rivals for the cheetahs when it comes time to hunt, they are pests when the cats are trying to enjoy their hard-earned feast. The annoying vultures don't bother the mother cheetah in the least. She knows that they will come in handy for her cubs. With their stomachs full, and without the aggressiveness that hunger brings, her little ones decide to have some fun. That's what their mother was expecting. She knows that these clumsy attempts to catch the vultures are a game that is helping to prepare her cubs for the hunting that they will soon have to do on their own. Finally, the vulture's obstinacy forces the young cheetahs to surrender the last remains of their prey. And the vultures get their trophy. Sunset in the Masai Mara. Twilight finds our herd next to the river crossing. A lot of zebras have already crossed, but many still haven't made up their minds. And the number of crocodiles is growing. Catching an adult zebra with its mouth requires extraordinary strength. The kind of strength you only find in crocodiles measuring over four meters or 13 feet long. Most crocodiles only really have the strength to capture the young zebras. So almost all the crocs go after the young ones. Even so, the energy and determination of many of the foals enables them to avoid what seems an almost certain death. The final rays of sunlight reveal that the river has taken its toll. The blood of the first zebras to be killed flows downstream with a message that will draw even more of the Mara's big crocodiles to these crossing points. Night falls on the savanna. The crocodiles climb out of the water their metabolic rate depends on the ambient temperature, and the nights in the Maasai Mara are quite cool. As a way to save energy, these large reptiles go into a sluggish and lethargic state. But other hunters are ready to take their place. If you've got good night vision, hunting after dark is much more efficient and productive. All the herbivores keep their guard up, or almost all of them. In the darkness, and with little effort, 
The elephants show who is really the king of the forest. Other predators take advantage of the dark to search for sleeping prey. Some lionesses have managed to kill a zebra, and the scent of blood attracts the attention of other hunters. Hyenas and lions are competing for prey once again. Lions are stronger, but usually there are greater numbers of hyenas than lions. And depending on how many hyenas there are in the pack, they can frequently chase off a lion or even kill it. Tonight, the hyenas managed to make off with the largest share of the kill. Dawn brings a very special day, a day which they have all been waiting a long time for and which our herd of zebras will make use of to cross the river with greater safety. The first columns of wildebeest appear on the plains. The main body of the Great Migration has reached the Maasai Mara. Every year, the wildebeest embark on a 3,000 kilometer or 1,850 mile trip that takes them from the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania to the Maasai Mara in Kenya and back again. In late January, the wildebeest give birth to their young on the plains in the southeastern part of the Serengeti. From there, the various herds of wildebeest slowly walk westward as their young gain weight and grow stronger. When the dry season begins to take hold of the Tanzanian plains, the animals head north. And in late summer, they cross the border and reach the highlands of the Maasai Mara in Kenya. They stay here until the rains allow them to return to the plains where they started their long journey. And all along this seemingly interminable route, the animals try to maintain a certain order. Lines of migrating animals, which prevent the large herds from wearing out the grasslands and the soil. In order to reach the highlands of the Maasai Mara Reserve, the wildebeest have to cross the Mara River. And year after year, they gather on its banks, where the zebras are already waiting for them. They all share the same destination, and they all share the same goal. But to reach that goal, they have to overcome the greatest obstacle yet on their long yearly journey and cross the Mara River. The rains falling on the highlands increase the flow of water from the tributaries of the Mara. In the shady spots, the hippopotamuses find ideal places to rest and feed. And the mother that we saw chasing off the crocodiles now cautiously leads her calf into one of these improvised oases. For the young hippopotamuses born the previous year, these seasonal pools are makeshift paradises where they can play. Mm. 
But for a mother with her calf, they can be dangerous places. The water is clearer here than in the river's main channel, and the males often drop by to check on their harems, something that alarms every female that has a calf. The males approach the females to see if they are in heat. If a female is in heat, a male will mate with her. But if the female is still suckling her calf, she doesn't arouse his interest, as long as the calf she is suckling is his. If the calf isn't his, the male may try to kill it in order to make the female go into heat again. And this makes every male in the pod a potential danger to the little calf. The hides of some of the females in the pod bear witness to the aggressive character of the dominant male. Dozens of scars crisscross the mother's thick skin, a price that she is more than willing to pay in order to keep her calf out of the reach of her aggressive suitor. In light of the dangers in the pool, our mother decides to return to the main riverbed of the Mara. It may not be as wonderful as one of the pools, but her calf will be safer there. In late summer, the zebras and the wildebeest gather on the savanna of the Maasai Mara. They are different species, but they form a team that many other animals depend on. The zebras, which eat the most, prefer tall, dry grasses, while the wildebeest like green grass. After the two groups have passed through, the savanna is ready for those animals that eat short grasses, particularly antelopes and gazelles, which thrive thanks to the prior passage of the migrating herds. At the same time, the grasses of the Serengeti to the south are richer in salts, vitamins, calcium, and phosphorus than the grasses of the Maasai Mara. The herbivores that live in the north year-round suffer from a lack of phosphorus, which lowers their birth rates. So as soon as the rains permit it, this army of grazers will head back south repeating their eternal migration year after year. And each time, they have to face the big challenge, crossing the Mara River. Our herd is still on the riverbank. One part of the herd has already crossed the river, but the other part is still on the opposite bank, afraid of the crocodiles that have gradually drifted in as the animals have arrived. The zebras are extremely anxious. The movements of our hippopotamus and her calf spook them once again. Hippopotamuses aren't a threat to zebras and sometimes even offer them a degree of safety because crocodiles keep their distance from hippopotamuses wherever they run into them. But the zebras are so edgy that none of them will cross the river until the hippopotamus stops to rest. As for our mother, she also prefers the solitude of the river current and finally disappears under the water with her calf. (laughs) 
Meanwhile, the wildebeest keep arriving by the thousands. Wherever there is a good place to ford the river, the Mara Riverbank is host to an impressive assembly of animals. All of them are nervous. As the herd grows in size, its members grow more and more impatient. Not one of them seems ready to make the first step, but they all want to cross the river. The zebras seem a little calmer now. Now that they are surrounded by all the wildebeest, it will be easier for them to cross the river. They know that wildebeest are easier prey for the predators and that they are less likely to be attacked if they cross alongside the wildebeest. Finally, the group pressure becomes unbearable and a wildebeest takes the first step and enters the water. As soon as the rest see their companions crossing the river, they all seem to want to go next. And in an instant, there is a true avalanche of wildebeest. It's not uncommon for the water levels of the river to have risen to the point where thousands of them drown. But when the time comes, when the pent-up tension is finally released, nothing seems able to stop them. Their impatience spills over. Their frenzied anxiousness to cross the river leads the animals to try new paths to the water, and it is literally raining wildebeest from the riverbank. The noise they make crossing the river can be heard for miles around, which draws numerous predators. The riverbanks are an ideal place to ambush them, and the wildebeest that climb out of the water practically exhausted are easy prey for the big cats. Lionesses hunt in groups. While some of the lionesses lie in wait among the bushes to attack them, others scout out the wildebeest in the open fields and lead the terrified animals to where a third cat is waiting to pounce. Thousands of animals passing through the water also attracts the hunters in the river. The big crocodiles have already gathered at the crossing points because they were drawn by the zebras that have been crossing the river for days. Now the best option for each of the animals is to seek safety in numbers and not to try to cross the river individually. In the chaos of the stampede, it's not uncommon for some of the animals to fall down the riverbank. This wildebeest has been separated from the group and seeing no way to climb back out, decides to cross by itself. Ah. 
something suddenly seems to stop him near the opposite bank. Some small crocodiles approach what looks like an animal that is helpless in the water, but for some reason they don't attack. Meanwhile, upriver, the majority of the wildebeest take advantage of their companion's distress to cross more safely. The lone wildebeest keeps fighting an invisible force. When the wildebeest finally manages to touch bottom and gain its footing, we can see what its problem is. A crocodile weighing close to a metric ton has latched onto its back. The crocodile knows that it has already won the battle. It only has to wait until the wildebeest tires out or until it enters an area of deep water where it can be drowned with little or no effort. Frightened by what they are seeing, two adults and a calf flee upriver. They have also fallen down the riverbank and are trying as hard as they can to rejoin the main body of the herd. The adults have an easier time of it, but it's almost impossible for the calf to climb the steep riverbank. As soon as it hits the water, the crocodiles go into motion. Its instincts tell the calf it must reach land immediately, and spurred on by its fear, the calf climbs back up, using its knees where its hoofs don't give it good enough foothold. It is terrified by what it sees from the riverbank. The giant crocodile doesn't release its prey even when it's near the riverbank. Without the water to support the crocodile's weight of close to a metric ton, the wildebeest is unable to climb out of the water. Fear gives the calf renewed strength, and it finally manages to escape the water. But things are very different down in the river. Exhausted, dragged down by the giant reptile, and pulled by the current to where it can no longer touch bottom, the lone wildebeest finally loses the fight. During the days of the Great Migration, the number of corpses on the savanna multiplies. Three different kinds of vultures share the remains of a wildebeest. The aggressiveness brought on by hunger determines who eats first. The hungrier they are, the more aggressive they are and the most aggressive vulture reaches the food first. The abundance of prey means that the predators can relax after a few days. Wildebeest and zebras are everywhere, and this means it's the perfect time to have offspring. The lionesses do most of the work when it's time to hunt. And now, when it's time to mate, they also take the initiative. The lazy male lies down. The female seeks him out, lets him smell that she is in heat, and finally manages to get him interested. Our herd of zebras is still split up on the two opposing riverbanks. Zebras take advantage of when the wildebeest cross the river 
because they know that the crocodiles prefer them as prey, since they are weaker and easier to handle. But two large crocodiles are still lurking near the crossing point, and this stops the herd at the water's edge. The zebras wait for some lone wildebeest to distract the enemy. The first is a young calf that has lost its way when the herd passed by. The crocodile catches its prey effortlessly. When a small group of wildebeest crosses the water downriver, it distracts the second big saurian. This time, the crocodile fails. And that could complicate matters for our zebras, because the noise they make as they swim across the river will draw the big hunter back again. Upriver, the tension is subsiding. The stomachs of most of the crocodiles are full, and so they've lost interest in the rest of the animals. They will spend long hours like this, motionless on the riverbank, letting the sun warm their metabolism and speed up their digestion. The zebras that have already managed to cross the Mara also relax, and the few that have died trying to cross the river are an acceptable price to pay for the herds that manage to reach the fertile highlands. Like the lions, the hyenas are also enjoying a period of abundance. The zebras and wildebeest will stay in their territory during the next few months. The hyenas will have plenty of prey, and the competition with the lions will be less intense. Hyenas have a matriarchal society in which the females make the important decisions. And like the lions, they know that this time of plenty is when their offspring have the best chance to survive. As a result, the hyenas also take advantage of this time of year to bring their pups into the world. The water from the rains that turns the Mara Highlands green again and draws the migrating herds up from the south, gradually runs into the river. The current grows at this time of year, and sometimes it becomes the deadliest killer of wildebeest and zebras. The last of the zebras in our herd are ready to cross, but the last of the big crocodiles has also returned, determined not to let this final opportunity go by after the wildebeest got away from it. Our mother and her foal weigh their options. They have to choose between crossing at the calm section of the river where the crocodile is waiting, or at the section with heavy currents. The rest of the herd chooses the currents, and encouraged by the group, our mother and her foal follow them. At first, the foal is doing fine. But as he swims farther into the river, the water begins to cover him, and he notices that the current is getting stronger and stronger. 
halfway across the river, the mother triumphs over the water thanks to her strength and height. The other adults gradually reach the other bank, but not without difficulty. The last stretch, where the current is most powerful, is the most difficult part. The adult zebras only manage to get through it by using all their strength. Our mother makes one last great effort and reaches her goal. But her foal reaches the riverbank exhausted and is unable to gain a foothold, so the current carries him downriver to where the water is calmer. And that's where they're waiting for him. The foal, exhausted and covered with mud, is close to drowning. He is easy prey for the crocodiles. And with his last remaining strength, he manages to gain foothold, and staggering, he tenaciously tries to reach the riverbank. His instinct tells him that death is stalking him in the water, and his instinct is quite right. He did it. He has passed the toughest test that he will have to face in his whole life. Mother and son rejoin the herd. The herd forms again. Now they have a period of plenty ahead of them when they can regain their strength before heading back south again. The zebras and wildebeest part ways. Close to two million animals break up into smaller groups and calm reigns once again on the banks of the Mara River. When all the herbivores have crossed, we meet two of our protagonists again. The crocodiles become almost dormant. Digesting a wildebeest or a zebra takes them weeks. Now they can hardly move, and as long as they are left alone, they are little threat to our mother hippopotamus and her calf. Mother and son are resting on the riverbank, surrounded by huge reptiles. The worst has also passed for them. The little hippo has gained weight and grown in size during the last few months. And the mother not only isn't worried about the crocodiles, but she even lets her calf have more contact with the rest of the pod every day. The other hippopotamuses have accepted the little one in the group. He calmly strolls into the river after his mother. He's already one more member of the pod, and surrounded by the colossal bodies of his relatives, few animals could feel safer in the Mara than our little hippo. Sundown finds all our protagonists enjoying a well-deserved evening of tranquility. Near the river, only a few slow movements are perceptible. The zebras and the wildebeest have parted ways and are grazing in small groups scattered all over the savanna. Our herd of zebras is busy regaining its strength for weeks, they will have peace and plenty. And all of them will make the most of this opportunity. Because none of them will forget that year after year, they have to face the river that marks the rhythm of the Great Migration. And they are the vanguard.